Our reading for this morning comes from the 27th chapter of Proverbs, where it says this, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Let another praise you, but in not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. A stone is heavy and sand is weighty, but a fool's provocation is heavier than both. Wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. One who is full loathes honey, but to one who is hungry, everything bitter is sweet. Like a bird that strays from its nest is a man who strays from his home. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, let the wisdom of your word reach our hearts. Help it to shape our lives and to shape our relationships with each other. Bless us this morning, Holy Spirit, that my words would be yours, and that our hearts, our minds, and our lives would become what you want them to be. Father, together we pray. Amen. So we have two weeks left in this summer-long sermon series, and we've been covering the topics and the questions that you guys submitted. And if in the course of this uh, series you've thought, man, I really wish I had gotten this question or this topic to him, it is too late. I'm not adding more. But you can still give them to me, and I'll start a list for maybe next summer. And this week, I think, of all of the ones we've done so far, this is probably the most how shall we say, immediately applicable and helpful to life? Because a lot, like, when we talk about heaven and hell, is it incredibly important and useful information? Yes. Is it going to change how you wake up on Monday morning? Probably not dramatically. Um, I did hear a yes, and we can talk about that, but not today. Today's topic is friendship, kind of. Because the original question that I received was, how do we say no without feeling guilty? Now, that's a really, really broad question. And I narrowed it a little bit because I combined it with a question I've received a couple times since I've been here, and that is, how do we say no to friends and family? And I thought that was a fair way to narrow it because it's a lot easier to say no to strangers, typically, than to your friends and family. Because if you say no to a stranger, you don't ever have to deal with them again. You just said no and you can move on with your life. But with friends and family, there can be some guilt there. And as I sat and I thought about it, I'm not saying these are the only places that guilt could come from, but three things kind of rose to the top is, here's why we might feel guilty. Now, the first reason for that, right, is maybe we feel like we shouldn't be saying no to friends and family at all. And I think this is something that the world we live, or well, maybe not the world, but definitely the culture we live in kind of pushes this where like, if you really love and care about someone, you're going to affirm and uplift and encourage them. And that's how the relationship's going to be defined. And those sound like good words, but maybe sometimes it's appropriate to say, and we're going to deal, we're going to talk about that. And then the other way I think maybe that guilt kind of can creep in is there's that question in the back of your head of like, yeah, it's okay to say no, but am I saying no in an appropriate context now. And we're going to deal with that. And the last thing that I was like, this is probably a big one, is uh, people feel guilty for saying no because they're people pleasers. Anybody, anybody feel that? Anybody identify with that a little bit? Yeah. We're going to deal with that a little bit, but at some point it's like, you kind of just got to get over it to not feel guilty. Like, but so, and how we're going to do this is we're going to go, I have a couple kind of uh, illustrations, some stories, and they're all true, and two of them are counterexamples, and they're about me, so no one's getting thrown under the bus this morning except for me. So first I want to deal with that. You're feeling guilty because you feel like you shouldn't say no to a friend. And it reminded me of, I, in high school I took a shop class. 
And I was in the shop class for three years, and the wood shop at my high school, it was the best wood shop I've ever been in, and it probably will be the best shop. I'll never get to, to play in a shop this nice ever again, and it breaks my heart. But this wood shop had several rooms. You had the main room that was probably bigger than this room with all of the tools in it, and then there was another room off to the back where all the lumber was stacked up, and there was another room off to the side with all the clamps that you could glue projects together, and there was a sealed room kept below a certain temperature so you could finish your projects with oil and with stain. And then there was a classroom because, you know, it's school. So there's a classroom. And, and every Wednesday when you went into shop class, you didn't go straight into the shop. You had to stay in the classroom for a little bit longer because you had to take the weekly safety quiz. Okay? Now, as you might guess, the weekly safety quiz, it, these, this is important information for you to have in a wood shop, right? And it's also not terribly complicated. Don't wear loose clothing and jewelry when you're using saws. Like this, you should know that. And if you just think about it for a second, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Don't leave, a, don't leave the saw while it's running. Like these should be obvious. And if you're going to be in a wood shop with 20 other high schoolers, everybody should agree we know these rules and we're going to abide by them. So every week we took a safety quiz. Well, the gentleman next to me, gentleman is so generous, uh, cheated, on, cheated off my quiz. Like, pretty flagrantly. I, I vaguely remember at one point he nudged me to move my hand so he could see more answers. And as any self-respecting nerd would do, what I started doing is I put all the wrong answers down, and then I made it as easy as possible for him to copy my answers. Like, I made sure it was on that side of the desk. I made sure my hands were free and clear. I waited till he stood up and turned his in, and I changed all my answers. And the craziest part is, it took him months to notice, wait a second, I'm failing all these quizzes, and he's still doing fine. There's something, something wonky here. Now, would anyone say I was being a good friend to that gentleman? And I discovered when I was talking with some people before service, some of you would. <laughs> but I don't think I was. And it, there's this, the Proverbs, we, one of the ones we read was, faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. In that time, in that space, I was operating in many ways as an enemy of this other kid. I was giving him everything he thought he wanted. I made the answers right there. I, I essentially, non-verbally said, yes, you may cheat off me. I was not his friend. <laughs> If I was his friend, what I would have said is, I, I would have said, Nick, you can't do this. Like, we're playing with saws in there. You have to know safety. And I would have, I sh if I was his friend, I could have gone even further and said, hey, let's take some time and let's study these rules so you can learn them. I would have told him no. I would have corrected him. That's what a friend would have done. That's what someone who cared about his well-being would have done. But instead, I helped him fail the class, um, which is insane. Who fails a woodshop class? But that's when we feel guilty saying, oh, we shouldn't say no to our friends. We should. Like, this is, this is something that biblically happens. If you look at Jesus' ministry, he does it a fair bit. He tells his disciples and he tells other people who he genuinely cares about, no, you shouldn't do that. No, I'm not going to do that for you. So that kind of, this first issue of guilt, if you're like, I don't know if I should say no to my friend, yeah, you should. But that kind of brings us into this second uh, possible source of guilt, where is it appropriate in this situation for me to say no or to correct my friend? And my story for this one, listen to my entire disclaimer, okay? It is about video games. If you don't do video games, if that's not your thing, it will still make sense and I think it will still be vaguely entertaining. So stick with me. But so my favorite video game, uh, it released a new mission called A Dungeon. And for anyone who's not in, the dun in video games, uh, dungeons are harder missions in this specific game. You typically do them with one to three people, and they take hours to finish. Okay, you're sitting in front, and you're working through something. It takes hours to finish. Now, in this dungeon, it was called the Grasp of Avarice. And I say that because I know some people will know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, 
I was determined, because all of my friends who used to play this game, they've moved on. It's just me. So I was like, I'm going to solo this one. I'm going to do it. And more than that, I was determined I was going to do it without looking up any guides on the internet. I was going to get no help. And the thing with dungeons, the bosses and everything, everything you have to kill is more difficult. But what's more, they have puzzles. And they'll like hide key pieces in the, so you have to find the piece to solve the puzzle to get through the level. And I was like, I'm not going to look up any help. I'm going to figure it out by myself. So I, I load into the mission and I drop into the mission. And I'm in like this, this like, courtyard looking thing and there's a door and there's no other opening in or out of the courtyard so I'm like ah I gotta go through the door that's how I'm gonna start the mission so I I run over to the door boom springboard of spikes dead as can be I respawn and I notice hey there's a control room over there I bet that's how I turn off the spikes so I run over to the control room boom spikes from the wall dead as can be this happens a lot Okay, this was like a theme for this dungeon is anytime you thought you were safe, spikes, dead as can be. Okay, so I make it through. It, it takes a while, but I make it through and I make it to the first mini boss. And I shoot rockets at this thing for like 30 minutes. Teeny tiny dent in its health. It kills me with one hit and it resets. And I'm like, okay, I can't do this by myself. I can't do it. So I call my brother Ian. I say, Ian, I know you don't really play Destiny anymore. I really need your help. I, like, I just need a second body in this mission to revive me when I die. So we figure, we figure out a schedule. We get on together, and we're going to play. And we load in into that courtyard. And Ian sees that door in the back. Anybody, if I said that I warned him, would anyone believe me? Good, because I didn't. <laughs> In fact, throughout the mission, anytime there was a trap that he wasn't going to spring, I did my best to like gently guide him to spring the trap that I had fallen for. Because I figured, it's funny if it's not me. <laughs> now, was I being a very good friend to my brother? No, not really. I was letting him die for my own entertainment. And the reason I tell that story is because that's an example of a really bad reason to say no or to correct a friend is for your own entertainment. If, if a friend comes to you and asks you to help with something and you say no, it's going to be funnier if I watch you struggle. Like that's, no, that's not a good reason to say no to a friend. You should feel a little guilty. You're being a bad friend. Okay? And another reason, like if you're just too lazy and like I could help you, but I don't feel like it, you should feel a little guilty for that. But if your friend is going to be better off doing something themselves, like they're going to learn something better, if you say, no, you need to do this, or no, you shouldn't do that, they're going to learn something, or they're going to grow, or their life is going to be better, those are good reasons, and you shouldn't feel guilt about saying, no, you, you got to do this, or no, you shouldn't do that. And this is, this is what we found in, toward the end of our reading in Proverbs. It says, the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. When we say no to friends, if we are earnestly desiring what is best for them in that interaction, we should, we should feel no guilt for that. And when we think about that third reason that I mentioned, the people-pleasing reason, you, gotta, you have to, and I know it's hard. I know it's hard, but you have to keep in the back of your mind, like, just because they're happy now, it doesn't mean I'm actually helping them. Because sometimes the best thing you can do for someone is to tell them no. Which brings me to my third example, which if I forced you to guess, I'm pretty sure most of you could guess this one, but it's our example of who's the prime example of what it means to be a good friend? Any guesses? Jesus, we can be brave. Jesus is the answer. He's our, and he says in his ministry, greater, and I don't have this verse, so don't panic that it's not on there. Greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So when we look to Jesus, and, and I don't, by, don't hear me do this. I'm not trying to box Jesus off and say, oh, he's just our friend. He is God. He is so much more than that. But he is also our friend. 
And when you look at his interactions with the people around him during his earthly ministry, with his disciples, with the people who followed him, he said no a lot. When he was talking about his crucifixion, Peter says, it shouldn't happen to you. And he says, no, get behind me, Satan. He said that to his friend, to one of his close friends. By all accounts, one of his favorite disciples, he said no and called him Satan. When you look at how he taught his disciples, he was frequently telling them no and correcting them and saying, I can't do this for you, or I'm not going to do this for you, or you shouldn't do things this way or that way. Jesus, to his friends, said no a lot. And the reason was always because it would be better for them. But what's really important, and I think a lot of people miss this, is you've got to watch how does he follow that up. When he rebukes Peter, he doesn't just leave him there. He is reminded, Peter is reminded again and again and again, because he keeps getting in these situations. Jesus reminds him that he loves him, that he is still in this relationship with him, and that there is still grace and forgiveness for him. So when we think about, well, how do we correct our friends? As Christians, we can't leave that part behind. Is it important for us to sometimes say no to the people that we love? Yes. Is it sometimes better off for them and that the most loving thing we can do is to correct them or to tell them no? Yes. But we can't ever leave behind that example that Christ gave us of now that you are corrected, do not forget that you are loved. That we are still brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are still friends, we are still family, and that you are always going to be forgiven even as Christ constantly calls us into a relationship with him that is characterized by love and by grace. Amen.